which are toward, around, and away from Nahid, tracking expressions of emerging Egyptian identity published in 2014, and recontextualizing resistance published in 2017, both by Cambridge Scholars Publishing UK. She has published book chapters, articles, and studies, and translated Egyptian short stories, the best-selling novel, A Quarter Ram, and the novella, My Father, an Egyptian Teacher. She taught at the American University in Cairo from 1993 to 2011, and also served as a radio announcer for Radio Cairo and hosted two cultural programs on Egyptian treasures and 21st century Egypt for the local European service of Cairo Radio for 15 years. Please join me in welcoming Professor Yusuf. Let me quote J. 
James Berlin, who said, truth and dialogue. Truth can be learned but not taught. Truth can be learned but not taught. And dialogue can remove error, but it is up to the individual to discover ultimate knowledge. The question is, what is available to our students, what is available to us, and what is available to learners generally? Nowadays, we are facing developments unheard of and certainly unthought of before the computer. Making use of modern electronic technology in changing our vision about teaching English and in advancing learning methods comes as no surprise at all. YouTube and Skype talks and lectures are readily available for whoever is willing and eager to learn. For Egyptians, distance learning and the open university e-learning experience have become quite popular. Today, we have better interactive systems to allow the learners to play a more positive role in acquiring a better command of English. But how can we put all this to good use? We need to train our students to conduct research and to tell their own story. My contention is that in Egypt there has been, there, there has to be a dramatic change in the way students learn. As Egyptian educators, we must create an awareness that in the learning process, the onus must be on the students. When Egyptians learn and communicate in, in, in English, they should be learning and communicating about their Egyptian life and culture, not Western life and culture, and possibly comparing them. This cannot be accomplished without reading and conducting research. I firmly believe in what Francis Bacon said, reading makes a full man, conference a ready man, and writing an exact man. And more, of course. We need to empower our students by training them to read, ask real questions, and conduct research at every level of the process of learning, and giving presentations about their findings. The internet is now readily available. All of those, all those who know me are aware that I am the daughter of storytellers, so storytelling seems to be in my genes. Recently, I observed myself telling stories in many classes, and the classes are varied in poetry, comparative literature, research writing, translation, culture. Students remember stories from teachers, who dare say because these stories give students access to the private life of their teachers. As teachers, you all know that the teacher is always in the spotlight and what the teacher wears, says, or does is always the subject of discussion outside the classroom. This is why we need to train ourselves to be both spontaneous and self-conscious. Now let me share a few stories with you. Here is my first. Professor Mehdi Wahba, who earned his PhD from Oxford University in the middle of the 20th century, and was one of the first Egyptian professors allowed to, to teach in the Department of English Language and Literature Faculty of Arts Cairo University, a department run in Cairo by the British. He taught me writing as a sophomore in 1976, and he examined my PhD viva in 1988. At that time, in 1976, when I was a sophomore, at that time, those of my generation will remember that we had little autographs, little colorful notebooks that we gave our teachers and friends to write something that rhymes and is flattering. Roses are red, violets are sweet, sugar is blue, sugar is sweet as white. Giving more to Professor Nancy Wahba, expecting him to sing my praises, being quite active at the time editing our English department bulletin and organizing trips, I received the autograph a couple of minutes later. Um, a couple of minutes later with a quotation. No
know thyself. Socrates, I hope you understand Magdi Weber. I walked away bewildered and forlorn. Of course I know myself. Why did Dr. Magdi write this? And this was a real question. This happened more than 40 years ago, and let me admit that I remember this quote every day of my life. And in time, I realized that knowing oneself is a lifelong endeavor. So our students need to know themselves and need to learn to tell their own story. Now, my second story is about British poetry and Egyptian freedom. My second story highlights the value of British teachers of English in colonial times in Egypt, the importance of research and translation. In 2001, I was assigned by the Egyptian Higher Council of Universities to write a survey about the translation of English romantic poetry into Arabic. Initially, this focus seemed dry, but proved to be challenging and even inspiring. We do know that the Napoleonic and British invasions of Egypt brought Egypt in contact with Western culture and subsequently Western poetry. When the British settled in Egypt in, 19, in 1882, still the heyday of romanticism, British teachers who came with their books, taught in Egypt, and read English romantic poetry in Egyptian classrooms. Such poetry, as we all know, highlighted liberty, equality, and fraternity, the motto of the French Revolution. One of the very interesting findings of my research was that the liberation spirit of the French and, and British romanticism inspired the 1919 Saad al-Nur revolution. And between World War I and World War II, the Arab Romantic movement reached its peak. So led me to discover that Shelley's Tour Skylark was translated 12 times in Egypt from 1910 to 1964 and nine times from 1920 to 1950 elsewhere. So the singing, the art, the freedom, the soaring, the beauty of the skylark inspired the poets and the intellectuals and I dare say the people of Egypt to call for their freedom and they earned it. My third story is about the production of knowledge. In January 2012, when Americans were warned not to come to Egypt, my friend Rochelle Davis of Georgetown University sent me an email to let me know that she will take part in a workshop at Cairo and Ain Shams universities and would like me to attend with two or three colleagues who teach writing. I inquired about the nature of the workshop, but Rochelle simply said, you will help me with an important project. To honor the courage of this American team, and trusting Rochelle as an academic and a friend, I asked no further questions. On the day of the workshop at the computer lab at Cairo University, it shocked me to find a big poster that said Wikipedia, all right? Yesterday we had Wikipedia also mentioned in the first plenary session. What was I doing uh, attending a workshop on Wikipedia? For years I have been warning my research students that if Wikipedia appears in their references, works cited, or bibliographies, they fail. And you know how students, when they're told they fail, they, they cringe, all right? At this point, there was no going back, and I had to remain silent, not because I had nothing to say, but because I had to follow the rules of propriety. The director of Wikipedia introduced Rochelle as training her students at Georgetown University 
to conduct research to write Wikipedia articles. And he had a slide with statistics about the numbers of Wikipedia articles in different languages. Listen to this. He gave us an alarming piece of information. The number of Wikipedia articles in Arabic is equivalent to the number of Wikipedia articles in the Polish language, although the population of Poland does not exceed the population of Shubra. We all know Shubra. It was Rochelle's task to take us through the steps to train our students to acquire the necessary skills to take part in writing Wikipedia ar articles in Arabic and English under our supervision. Working on this project with my, student, with my students confirmed that Wikipedia cannot be cited in research. However, the, the interaction to pr produce these articles has been teaching me and my students a great deal. All the activities empowered the students to learn not the facts or basics, but to acquire the skills to learn how to learn. Story four. Learners are happy when they are productive, but happiness and productivity are demanding. My passion for conducting research and teaching research writing has been, has been growing for almost 40 years. I'm ancient. And the tools of research have radically changed during these four decades. Libraries and classrooms around the world have gone through a metamorphosis, and the Egyptian Knowledge Bank is making serious attempts to establish a link between what students are learning and what is available in the Egyptian Knowledge Bank. Our role as educators is to help students experience moments of light in which they realize that reading, speaking and writing in any language are skills one needs to develop as one does in order to play football or sing and dance. Like other muscles in the body, the brain needs to be used, nourished, and trained in order to be productive. At Cairo University, we have workshops to train teachers to have a research component in the class, whether the class focuses on poetry, drama, novel, culture, language, or teaches English to archaeologists, engineers, political scientists, historians, geographers, and the list goes on. In this case, the role of the teacher is twofold. First, the teacher has to be a researcher, a learner. And second, the teacher has to train students to formulate research questions, conduct research individually and in groups, and to tell their own story. The teacher cannot teach students to conduct research or to tell their own story without, without conducting research or telling a story himself or herself. Both teacher and student need to be productive, and productivity in one language, Arabic or English, enhances productivity in the other. Although our focus and purpose is to teach English, our mission and vision in doing this is to produce knowledge that will enrich our Egyptian and Arab culture and share this knowledge with others. This is what I share with my young faculty members. When Edward Said was writing Orientalism, I was an undergraduate, but if I am unaware of the field of knowledge that was a result of this book, I would not be teaching in academia. When I went, when, uh, that although I lived in Cairo, I, this is again some of the issues I share with my students, that although I lived in Cairo all my life, when I needed to write about Cairo, I had to conduct research. Although I went on Hajj, 
when I had to translate a chapter in a book from Arabic into English about the Hajj experience, I had to read in order to use the correct jargon. When I worked on having an academic integrity policy at Cairo University, I had to conduct research. When I collaborated with a team to establish an anti-harassment unit at Cairo University, the team had to consult anti-harassment NGOs in Egypt and conduct research on how different countries in the world are fighting the phenomenon in order to see if any of their experiences elsewhere can help us. Students need to prepare for class and play an active role. Being Egyptian students who studied Balera at school, they should know that khayrul kalam ma qalla wa dal. Being students of the English language, they need to be familiar with the field of rhetoric that stresses the importance of logos, pathos, and ethos, and that communication involves a writer or a speaker, a reader or an audience, and a purpose. What they communicate has to have form and content and should therefore capture the attention of the audience. <clears throat> now, this is also a quotation from George Orwell's Politics and the English Language. And George Orwell tells his British people that in order to read and write, there are rules. To use a language, there are rules. Never use a metaphor, figure, a metaphor, simile, or figure of speech which you are used to seeing in print. Never use a long word when a short word will do. If it is possible to cut a word out, always cut it out. Never use the passive where you can use the active. Never use a foreign phrase, a scientific word, or jargon, or jargon word if you, think, if you, think, if you can think of an everyday English equivalent. And then with his sense of humor, he says, break any of these rules sooner than say anything outright barbarous. Now, my last story. My last story is set in three research writing classes. One at AUC, where I taught for 19 years. Another in the Faculty of Arts Cairo University, where I belong as a faculty member. And a third at the Open University. The common denominator in all three cases is for students to read and write about a theme that has to do with Egypt, or that establishes a link between Egypt and any other country. The, the decision to focus on Egypt is because during one of the orientations we received two decades ago as faculty members at the AUC library at the beginning of the term to inform us about new electronic sources at the AUC library and on the internet. The librarian said that when using general research terms to search on the internet, we get thousands of entries. Once Egypt is added to the search, there are no sources unless the, the research has to do with ancient Egypt. As a team of teachers, we agreed that this has to change. Our students started writing on controversial issues in Egypt, advertising, drugs and addiction, the decline of the Egyptian film industry, problems in Egypt that require immediate attention, human rights issues, the rhetoric of protest, and the list goes on. Generally, when cho students choose a focus they are interested in, their research experience becomes memorable. I am proud of my student, Dr. Monica Hanna, who chose to write about an Egyptian controversial figure in the field of Egyptology and became an Egyptologist herself. Last week, someone stopped me on the street and said, Do you remember me, Dr. Lubna? I was your student 10 years ago, and my paper was about coffee shops in Egypt. Two other common denominators are to stress that students will not write about the summer holiday and the advantages and disadvantages of television. 
and have to abide by the rules of academic integrity. These are two challenging issues for both teachers and students. Although the writing courses in Arabic at school in Egypt are called insha', which literally means composition, teachers rarely define the term with their students and the idea of composing an original piece that has form and content is simply not focal. What is also as serious is that students are not told that they have to cite a source when using the ideas and words of others. This has to change, not only in teaching English and Arabic, but in teaching history, geography, etc. In an exam, students in an English critical thinking class and research skills class at the Open University had to answer questions about the following extract from Bern Wolf's book, How to be Happy Though Human. And the, and the extract says, as a human being, you have the choice of three basic attitudes in life. You may approach life with the philosophy of the vegetable, in which case your life will consist of being born, eating, drinking, sleeping, maturing, mating, growing old, and dying. Of human vegetables, there are no end, and theirs is a common contentment undisturbed by the problems of this world. They require neither books nor teaching, since the, veg since the vegetation is the be-all and the end-all of, of the human vegetable's life. The same providence that protects puppy dogs and earthworms watches over their destiny and provides their simple wants in life. They vegetate at the lowest level consistent with humanity. And as they never read books, we need not disturb their placid existences by useless instruction in the art of living. The second attitude is to look at life as if it were a business. The third attitude toward life is the approach of the artist. Such an extract gives the teacher and the students a great deal to discuss and write about. The following term, this extract, this exam, was discussed in class for, re for three reasons. First, because students always ask about exams, and this is a way to avoid such a question. Second, students realize that gone are the days when a question about the passage they read on an exam paper is simply one of comprehension. Third, the questions required that they compare the three attitudes, determine whether they adopt the first, second, or third, and explain why, and explain why identify someone in their lives who belongs to each group, and explain what the writer means by to look at life as if it were a business and the approach of the artist. We also discussed the tone of the writer. It is true that this passage is not about Egypt, but they don't have to read.
online courses are announced on the Relocare Facebook page. Is that everybody from your group? Okay, good. We will uh, online them. courses. Thank you. Nope. We just have to sum up to summarize them. So there, there, are, three there are three things. There are three things. There's the e-teacher, which is an online master's course. There's a scholarship for it. There's webinars, which are short classes that happen every two weeks on the Facebook Live page. Yeah. And then there is yeah. MOOCs, yeah. massive uh, um, free classes online, like free programs, like a semester long. When just webinars, webinars uh, every weekend, it's like every Wednesday, Wednesday, Wednesday. 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 around 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Every two weeks. 3 p.m. and 7 p.m.
sometimes an obstacle. I heard the parents, the parents' interference as an obstacle. What else did you have? Administration interference as an obstacle. The culture as an obstacle for which? Culture as an obstacle for They don't appreciate the learning of English, the culture? No, no, difference in ideas. For which, for which problem? Um, maybe the teacher students um, to speak. When we speak in English, it's different because we, we, we teach uh, Egyptian students. So sometimes the culture uh, plays a, a good role to uh, speak English in the class. It affects the learning. It discourages language. students from speaking. Yeah. So the students are more passive. They yeah. are, the culture is okay. to be more passive. Yeah, I'm right in the students' needs. Uh, there is no enough time to just cover all oh, yeah, cover all these diversity things. in the classroom. Yeah. Not yeah. everybody in the same at the same yes. point, right? Uh, no, there is no enough activities, CV activities, or sport activities to enhance critical thinking skills. So where are the act not enough activities? The school pub and the course book. Oh, the course book. The book doesn't have enough activities for uh, enhancing uh, critical thinking. Skills. For enhancing critical thinking. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, my obstacle with my students, uh, which need the most effort from me, is that they can't differentiate between English as a language and English as a subject. They they think of English as subject most of the time because of the exam. So they don't they, see. They can't how adapt to the idea of a lang language, language, living the living the language. Uh, yeah. It's not use. They don't see how it's useful for them or something. Yeah. Maybe be, because they can't, so they, they yeah. don't see that this is good for the exam. Uh, if you, if I, I ask them to speak more, the exam based on a written, uh, written mm -hmm. base, not talk. So they neglect most of the time how to speak. Because they're only interested in passing the exam. Yeah. Um, yes. Maybe the student's uh, personality. I can't control it. Sometimes they are shy so that they can't work in team. Uh, they like to do things individually without the teamwork. Students are shy so they can't work in team. Yes. Sometimes students are shy so they can't work in team. Or lack of interest. Students are not interested. Not qualified teachers. I'm a qualified teacher, yeah, okay. but that's mm -hmm. not you. You're not going to be the unqualified <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think that, uh, the type uh, of assessment it's very important that uh, it's a big obstacle for us. Okay. Test. Oh, test. Uh, how can I assess uh, my students? Uh, for what? Uh, uh, must be based on activities. Okay. You're not
you finish, have a look together if you have the same. Let's hope it works, technology. So here are some important facts about the IELTS listening test. First of all, it lasts 30 minutes and there are a total of 40 questions. There are four audio sections and each section has 10 questions. Now there's a variety of interaction patterns in those four sections of the listening test. So, for example, There's no such thing 
The great grammarians discovered everything about grammar already, and what the corpus what the corpus materials do, do is help give us some more information here and there. And this is from a guy who has published grammar based on corpus. I mean, so he's not just being an old buddy-duddy. He uses corpus, but he's got a very good point. We know the meanings of words. We know the grammar. But corpus gives us more information, which can help us get to the kinds of things our students need based on who our students are. And so keep that in mind as I go through this. So I'm going to go through something called the Collins Dictionary, followed by the, the uh, English Profile, which has a lexical and a grammatical aspect to it. The Collins uh, Corpus is different from the English Profile Corpus, two different sources, but they're both very useful. Okay, so I'm going to start with the Collins Dictionary. And you can access it from collinsdictionary.com. It is free to use. You don't need to sign up or anything like that. And if you're as old as I am, I'm about to hit 40. And if you were take, using the internet at some time in the mid-90s, you'd say, this doesn't look very different from anything I used back then for a dictionary. And you're right. On, uh, on the surface here, it doesn't look different at all. But it, is ba it does utilize corpus materials. And I just realized I forgot to take out my little cheat sheet here, so I have it now. And so what I'm going to do is look up some words from it. Can you share your experience with us? Okay, I'm going to post a lesson regulation. Uh, so I have written many articles about the relationship with the April 20th with the self regulation. So we designed, um, all of us, we have the Gmail accounts, and then we have the portfolio. We started to have four sections for the e-portfolio. The first one is going to be for the task that we're going to share inside the classroom. And the last one will be for reflection. The second one was for uh, the presentation that we do inside the classroom. They upload the videos or the presentations, the, the recordings. And the third one was for any extra material. They believe that they are related to the topic that we are presenting. Okay, so you use the portfolio for them to collect their work on that certain experience assignment to reflect on it. Each and time we have reflection, and they just uh, assignment by assignment. They used to go home, and then they do their reflection. And then they could add even more that they felt was really extra. Yes. Anybody else? No, that's why you're here. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think some purposes were? What purposes did you talk about? To track uh, the progress of the students all the time. Uh, to also have uh, constant feedback when it comes to a special like, uh, an assignment, a quiz, uh, whatever the task that has been done, just get that immediate feedback and you can track your progress. Um, I guess one of the, the, the positives as well, that the, the students themselves can assess themselves in, in specific tasks that you can put to, through the portfolio. Um, you also don't need any paper for this. It's already electronic, so that's... <laughs> Sustainable for the environment. So, yeah. Okay, so tracking progress mm -hmm. for doing some self assessment. Mm -hmm. When working with uh, children or teenagers, it's also a great tool for parent communication. Oh, okay. Keeps them up to date with what's going on in the classroom, how mm -hmm. their child's progressing. Okay, any other? And then how can it play in the assessment? One way is to communicate the assessments to parents students to get think about their assess themselves through the reflection. <laughs> Any other ways that you can use it for assessment? It's maybe for positive assessment because all the time this is an ongoing process. Right. Each task we are going to see it and give feedback and when they reflect they reflect about my presentation. So I think this is feedback for me. Right. So we are exchanging feedbacks all the time. So positive feedback yeah. between you and the students. Okay. So you pretty much told me what it was and what the purposes are. So it's not a collection of all the words that are in this book. Or in the It's more selective. It's to have students reflect on their learning and their achievements. For them to actually choose evidence that presents how they feel they achieve learning outcomes of a course. It actually helps them 
to do independent learning and thinking about themselves and to start being able to express themselves and to document their learning, especially for courses that are professionally accredited, to show this evidence that you need to make for accreditation purposes. And it supports lifelong learning in that you can then take this through to job interviews, which you can learn over time how you grow. It's a much more interactive, rich medium than just having a CV. So employers can actually see you speaking an interactive and actually your thinking process through those So the purposes is as a display or product portfolio where you're picking out your strongest work, or as a process like we mentioned, over time different points that you did as well. Yes. Look, looking at the progress in your development over time. And the last one is more as an end product to be able to evaluate as part of a graduation requirement, especially in the higher group. So we're going to talk about an outcome space portfolio. So what does that mean? It's to reflect on learning pro or progress and achievement and in relation to learning outcomes. So they're going to do some reflection about how these products that they've chosen reflect how they chance to be the winner of the book of your choice, okay? And you got that book from uh, Amethyst Booth and Rail Booth or British Council. Okay, why don't we choose one? Okay, so okay the first one is. Take your breath. <laughs> okay. Sarah Shreve, Ali. Yes, yes here. Big hand, please. Yes. Big hand. Okay. <laughs> please come.
Indonesia, okay. Uh, 2,400 plus years ago, and for which basically he was killed by the state. This idea of freeing the mind. This is something that Plato really developed beautifully in, a, in an allegory of the cave, all of the cave. And on this wall, there are, there are images, let's say of a tree, whatever it is. And we don't have statues and shadows on the wall. And he describes the way we live in this world and we think it's real. We live in a world of illusion. We need to free ourselves from this illusion, but it's incredibly difficult. Why should we even think we should? There's no reason to believe there's anything beyond the world of, illu of illusion. There, we don't know their illusions. We accept what we see. Critical thinking means waking up to the reality that we may be prisoners of this illusion, that there's, there may be other people controlling the images that we see, and therefore what we think, and therefore who we are. That we need to take charge. Somehow we need to free ourselves from these chains. And if we do that, we're going to recognize that there is perhaps a way out, and that there's another world beyond the cave that we're in. It's very difficult. But you might be able to make your way up to the surface, and there, according to Plato, you will see the real tree. Not the statue, not the image, but the real tree, which is three-dimensional and, and alive. And you'll see that it's illuminated by the sun, which for him, people have taken this for 2,400 years as sort of an image of God, the light of truth and of being that illuminates reality. We need to find the light of truth. We need to turn our souls away from illusion and find the light of truth. It's a very difficult journey. But that's what philosophy is about, the love of wisdom. That's what all of us are. We're all philosophers in the sense that we want the truth and we need to stand up for our right to have it. We need to make the difficult journey beyond the world of illusion, even if we're not sure that there really is a world beyond uh, and, and so on. That's something that we haven't yet found. But by the way, Plato continues his story. When the, when the philosopher sees the truth, he realizes that he has to go back down into the cave. But his eyes have been dazzled, or her eyes have been dazzled by the, by the light of truth. So she stumbles around in the cave and she says to everyone there, you know, listen, you're prisoners. It's, can you imagine running up to people and said, Get, take, stop looking at your cell phone. You're a prisoner to Facebook. People are going to say, what? You're nuts. Leave me alone. Eventually, they'll take this person away as a crazy person. Plato actually has that in his story. That's a big part of it. The thing he doesn't talk about is who's the person with the images on the parapet? Who's controlling the images we see. He doesn't discuss that. It's just there in the story. That's the question we need to ask more than anything else. I want to quickly mention another philosopher, Descartes. Uh, the, the problem with Descartes is that he came up with this wonderful saying, I think therefore I am, in order to find certainty. I know that I exist because I think, okay, that's terrific. But the problem that he, that he brought about in the 17th century is that we turned away from even being a community to being alone 
isolated. This is known as solipsism. I alone exist. And we also, he also made the world and my body very disembodied, very abstract. And so these are very unfortunate directions. And basically, it's, we're not even a community in the cave anymore. The cave is my own mind. And I'm isolated in my own reality, and I have no idea if there's another reality out there or not, or whether, you know, I'm in touch with it. This is a kind of madness. And when we destroy truth, what's left is madness. This is known as gaslighting. You may have heard that phrase. That the, this is the, it's used a lot in relation to Trump and what's going on. That we're, we're losing touch, we're being manipulated to, we don't even know what's real anymore. Now, Descartes didn't intend that, but I want to talk about Newton. You notice he's reading a book by Descartes, and he's sitting under the tree, and he gets hit on the head by an apple. The difference between Newton and Descartes is that Newton was out there in the world, and an apple fell on his head. And the point is that if an apple fell on my head, I'd probably be like Trump. I would be full of intuition, of anger, of feelings. Who threw that? But Newton was enough influenced by Descartes that he looked at it as an object having properties like acceleration, movement, direction, vectors, and also this thing that Descartes didn't have called mass. Something solid, something that has weight and substance. We need to return away from Descartes to a world that has substance. But and Newton is one of those people that did that. Again, Immanuel Kant, right? Abstract ideas are not enough. We need to learn the methods of reasoning, but we also need to go out into the world and connect with other people. Uh, obviously, you know, this is something that is at the heart of everything that we do. We need to free ourselves within the cave and discover who's pulling the strings. Whether or not we know the answer, we don't know the answer about what lies beyond the cave, but we need to believe in the quest, right? The word question is related to the word quest. We need to ask questions and we need to see ourselves on a journey, a quest, a quest for the truth. We need to have a certain element of faith. So I would end by saying that what is really needful is a whole set of ideas, and this is not an exhaustive list, but I would certainly mention these as some of the things that I think we need to, uh, we need to focus on. We need to be clear thinkers. We need to understand valid reasoning and we need to use it. But we also need to understand what evidence is. We need to assess it. We need to be able to judge. Even if we're not experts, we need to be able to say, that probably isn't true. It doesn't make sense. I don't believe it. A healthy skepticism. We need to know how to defend ourselves from fallacies. We need, most importantly, to see the bigger picture. This is what gets really hard. How do you know what you don't know? How do you recognize that the, with all those numbers, about the 37,000 and 119,000, how do you know what you're missing? That's a very difficult thing. It requires stepping back and seeing the big picture. We have to have a desire for truth and a belief that there is truth. And we have to have the courage to question, above all maybe to question our own convictions. Courage is a big part of this. Also confidence. You could call this faith. Confidence that we can know, that we can think, that we can move closer to the truth. And we need to do this in a, sustainably, in a sustainable community of inquiry. We need to realize that this cannot be done alone. That we need to have a community of people that we trust, that we rely on, and that we work with together to try to work uh, out the truth. And, and not a community of people that have resentments and fears of experts and just think that the truth is all some big conspiracy by some you know, paper in New York. And we need to connect with other people. So what I just did was to typify the, the Trump supporter. We need to get over that. I need to get over that. You know, Trump supporters are not all ignorant hillbillies. Some of them are, but not all of them. And even those people, I've met a few. They're wonderful. We need to reach out to them and help them overcome their prejudices and become, like we all want to become, lifelong learners. So I thank you very much. I, I wish I had more time, but that, I think I got through all my slides. I've, I've enjoyed this very much. I'll see you later. for empty board seats. As you came in, you would have seen a PowerPoint with the accomplishments of the different committees. And so what we're going to next do is go through the meeting minutes very quickly from last year. Okay, so you would have received the meeting minutes in your email box if you are a Nile TESOL member. And these are the meeting minutes from the General Assembly last year at the conference. And so this is just the opportunity to point out if there were any errors or omissions in it, 
And so I'm just scrolling very quickly through this. And so we have here the, co the committee reports for the different committees. And then the, uh, the certificates for the TOT program were handed out, presented certificates of appreciation to departing board members, and introduction of the new president, which was me at the time, although I'm no longer the new president. Then we had a raffle and no other business. Okay, do we approve these minutes from last year? Very good. Approved. Very nice. Okay. Okay. So now what we are going to do is get into elections. And it is a very exciting year because we have a lot of change that will happen on the board. And this is our opportunity collectively to vote. And what I want to do is talk about something new that we're doing. So we're going to present board member, uh, uh, the candidates here, and we have five open seats, and you would have received in your email the five seats that are open, as well as a link to the candidate biographies and personal statements that you could have read before today's General Assembly. So we have five open seats that we're considering today, including Al-Azhar Schools and University, AUC at large, two member at large candidates, uh, national universities and president elect so each candidate will present for two minutes uh, just why they want to sit in the, be on the board and I will time you all two minutes maximum because of time limits um, and let me see I missed my place here and so yeah for each seat you will choose only one candidate and I'll talk about voting in a minute. But for member at large, there are two open seats. So you can vote for up to two people for member at large. And so what we're going to do today is something a little bit different. And so let me go to the right web page. So we're going to do online voting this year. But don't worry about it. Because we also have the traditional voting. What I would like to encourage all of, we want to have as many people as possible vote online, and we try to do this as simple as possible. So if on your technology, if you're logged into your cellular plan, or you are logged into the AUC Wi-Fi, I would like you to type niletsol.org. So if you go to the web page, which I'm sure all of you are very familiar with now, you are going to see the front page, and when you scroll down, there's going to be a yellow ribbon in the middle which says click here to access, to access the 2018 General Assembly page. So if you can go down to that ribbon, you can click read more, and you'll go to the General Assembly page. Okay, on that page, the top link is please vote for Niall Tesol members here. And that is where you will click and you will see here the Google form where you can vote. And all seats are on the Google form. So you can vote for those after you hear the presentations. Now, if you are nervous about voting online or if you uh, are having technical difficulties, our ushers have paper ballots but only use a paper ballot if you are not voting online, okay? One or the other. So if you want a paper ballot instead, just please raise your hand and an usher will come by and give you one. And after you have voted, once everybody has spoken, you can just raise your hand and make sure the usher takes it back from you to be counted later. Okay, and again, please only use electronic or paper, not both. Okay. So again, what we are going to do now is go to the speeches of the candidates. Um, and what I will do is have their photo here as they speak. And candidates, you can speak into the microphones in front of you and just speak where you are, okay? Okay, so better to stay here, and speak in the microphones that you're, yes, okay. So I'm going to have their picture up here and we'll just go through the order of the seats. And please just, when they are done speaking, make your vote on the paper or on the Google form for each of the seats. So the first that we are going to do 
our Al Azhar schools and universe, or universities, and we too have two candidates, starting with Amr Saleh. So you can please start speaking. Can you speak? Okay, good afternoon and assalamu alaikum everyone. My name is Amr Saleh. So at Al Azhar University, it's, as you know, it's a mega university and we have 470,000 students. And we have 83 colleges where students are studying English as uh, obligatory for two semesters. And I am the director of the EFL programs at Al Azhar University. I started this post uh, three months ago. And uh, I think I, I want, or I'm interested in uh, being in this boat because I can add to the effectiveness of this boat and I can help in communicating and building bridges with the other institutions who are being represented in this boat. So that's why I'm applying for this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amr. So the second candidate for Al Azhar is Hamid Al Sayed. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for giving me this opportunity to uh, introduce myself. My name is Hamid Al Sayed from Al Azhar English Training Center. Uh, Al Azhar English Training Center is a joint project between Al Azhar University and the British Council that aims to provide language classes to students at Al Azhar University as well as English for religious purposes. Um, I have Currently, I'm the teaching center manager of Al Azhar English Training Center. In my job, I've got experience in dealing with teachers at both the university and the institute's levels. I've also got the experience of supporting teachers with their professional development, uh, either by uh, organizing teacher training or, and delivering teacher training as well. Um, by the way, I am a graduate of Al Azhar uh, University. I have a BA in English Language and Literature. I've got, I've got also an MA in Professional Development for Language uh, Education from the University of Chester. Uh, this uh, MA program has enabled me to, to get the knowledge, the necessary knowledge of uh, the CBD activities that could help teachers. By being a member of the Nanati Sol board of directors. I hope that I will be able to raise the Nile TESOL profile within Al-Azhar, as well as engage teachers from Al-Azhar to be part of that uh, professional development uh, community. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and please vote for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hamid. So it seems like we've run out of paper ballots. Um, I think they're going to try to pass out paper, but if you are able to access online, please do it. Please do it, because we want to move to this in the future. Okay, next, we're going to talk about the AUC at large seats. So even though, even if you're not at AUC, you can vote for AUC at large. And the first one is going to be Leila Kamal. Okay, please start. Uh, good afternoon. I just want to give you an idea about my educational background. I have taken the Senna Wayama, I was in the Faculty of Arts Cairo University, and I uh, taught in the United Arab Emirates University for five years, English as a university requirement. I then came back to Egypt and I taught in DPS, Center for Adult Education now, and I took my uh, MA in TEFL in 1990, and I've been working in AUC ever since. I've taught English for academic purposes and other courses at AUC. Uh, I've, taught, I've, uh, gone, I've uh, gone to a lot of conferences, national and international, and I've attended almost all 90 cell conferences. And I'm quite familiar with the kind of people that attend these conferences. I'm quite familiar with the educational system in Egypt and its weaknesses. And I know how, I hope, I can make a difference in uh, creating a link between AUC and other education institutions in Egypt. I'm very interested in giving workshops uh, involving teacher training. Uh, I'm interested in assessment and uh, try, I've been a member of the assessment committee, uh, the rubrics assessment, the rubrics committee in, uh, in our department and I think I can um, uh, give a little information in this area. Uh, I'd like to, um, I'd also like to use technology in the classroom and I'd like to, to show teachers how this can be a very, very lucrative 
um, a way of teaching because nowadays everyone is interested in internets and computers and I think that this can make teaching much, much easier and we make students more interested in teaching and I just hope I'll be able to, if I become a member, to establish a strong link between AUC and other institutions in Egypt. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leila. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a second candidate for the AUC at large seat, who is Mustafa Youssef. Okay, and instead of uh, going through my bio, you can find that online, but let me go just through uh, my top five uh, goals uh, on my plan. First of all, fellowship. We need to have more Nile Tisi members than members of Nile Tisi. So we need to celebrate our diversity, our solidarity, not just have an association, but it's more about fellowship. Uh, number two, uh, having an IT from being prescriptive to responsive. So instead of setting the theme, let's say about uh, learning technologies, and uh, we have almost all of the session about technology or about special theme, we can send you surveys to understand your needs in a better way, get to know your needs, uh, what you need to find in the conference. So we can cater for your needs, address your needs in a better way, so it's more suitable to you. Three, uh, decentralization, which means we can't have all of the events here in Cairo and just sit in an ivory tower. We need to have more events in different governorates, and I guess we need to have a coordinator in different governorates, for example, in Alexandria, Aswan, uh, Suez, everywhere, so they can liaise with the board and we can reach out, uh, reach out to uh, more places. Four, diversity, because we have almost all of the sessions about uh, uh, teaching reading, listening, skills, but we need to have more sessions about English for academic purposes, English for specific purposes, teacher training, because uh, um, we come from different backgrounds. Some teachers would like to get promoted to being teacher trainers, English language teaching management for supervisors, for coordinators, so uh, uh, we need to have that kind of diversity. And uh, number five, feasibility and contextualization, which means Sometimes you come and attend uh, some sessions uh, which are, for example, about e-portfolios, uh, digital learning, and sometimes we need to go to schools or, uh, I mean, uh, sometimes in different governorates or in different villages you have uh, people with different backgrounds. So, uh, okay, very few schools, for example, or from different backgrounds need something more suitable. Okay. We've had the two minutes. We've had the two minutes. Thank you, okay. guys. Thank you, Mustafa. Okay. Okay. So the next group is member at large, and as I said earlier, there are two empty seats on the board, or two, I should say, uh, seats converting to new people. Um, and so I'd like to ask you to vote for up to two when you make your choices. And we have five candidates. We will start with Amal Abu Sitta. Hello. Can you hear me clearly? Um, hi, my name is Amal Abusetta. I am the Managing Director of uh, Advantage for Leading Training and Consultancy Academy. I have a PhD in Educational Research from Lancaster University in the UK and a Master's Degree in TEFL from AUC. Uh, I have um, over 20 years of experience uh, in the educational field in general, specifically in English language teaching. Um, and um, experience in um, further education, higher education. Um, I'm also a published writer, both academic and non-academic, uh, and I have experience in teacher training and in educational management. The reason why I'm running for this candidacy is that um, I have, um, I'm committed to educational development in Egypt, especially uh, the, language, the English language teaching profession. And I would like to contribute through uh, the board of Nile Diesel, um, through um, the professional development of uh, the, the professional development SIG uh, on the board. Uh, I believe in the empowerment of teaching of, and teachers, uh, and I would like to do this and contribute to doing this through setting and implementing professional development programs. Uh, I would like to find ways to provide support and guidance. And I believe that at this point in my career, this should be my role to give back to the community of English language teaching. So uh, this is the opportunity that I'm looking forward to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. Okay. Our second uh, candidate is Dr. Iglal Hosni El Gamal. 
Okay. Uh, actually, I've applied for this position before, but I didn't have the chance to be one of the nominees. So thank you very much for giving me this chance. So whether I lose or win, it was a great experience for me. So uh, I believe my working experience and passion for developing teachers make me a suitable candidate. As a marketing manager for an international publisher, I work in Egypt, Jordan, and the Gulf area. And my skills in curriculum designing, teaching methods, and ELT cons uh, consultant, uh, I'll be able to play a dynamic role within this position. With my enthusiasm to work in the Nile Tiesel Board of Directors, I work on providing continuous improvement for English language teaching, in addition to applying the latest development in the field. As an instructor and a consultant and teacher trainer, I have conducted a great number of seminars inside and outside Egypt and performed in-service training sessions where I trained teachers on books and methodologies and provided them with tools and strategies to improve fluency and develop their skills of English. So I possess a broad knowledge of the nature of language teaching in all these countries. I hope through this position, with the help of other members, if I win, we maintain Nile Tisa reputation as an effective leading association by giving teachers more time to learn and implement new strategies and to help them to develop and strengthen their practice throughout their career, believing that training and good development should be available for all. Thank you very much, and I would like to thank all my friends who came here to support me. Love you all, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. So the next speaker is Karaman Mohsen. Good afternoon. I'm Karaman Mohsen, an English instructor with nine years experience. I'm applying for member at large position because I do understand your needs, my fellow teachers, for self and professional development. I have the actual field experience in seeing my TESOL teachers uh, in teach education SEC. The minute I joined the SEC, I worked on reaching out for as many of you as I can. Of course, with the guidance and support of the SEC chair and the help of my colleagues in the steering committee, I was able to organize three workshops with over 80 attendees in each. I tried to reach you and share my experience through Nile Tiesel newsletter and Humans of Nile Tiesel. My goal now is having communicative Nile Tiesel. In case I got elected, I would recommend that Egyptian presenters who attended other international conferences outside Egypt to share their experience with us. Not all of us can afford attending international conferences. I'd also help novice teachers by introducing new sessions called reviving sessions. Uh, in which novice teachers will present all sessions that were held successfully by professional presenters. This will also be helpful for us as not all of us can attend each and every session during the conference. I'd like to share my experience as AEE teacher program teacher trainer course recipient, the opportunity which showed me more international challenges and how to solve them. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next member at large candidate is Mayada Zaki. Hi. Um, I'd like to link my uh, experience with my goals, okay? So, uh, is that okay? So, first of all, I'd like to ask you, who has a dream for his career, for the future? Who has a dream this year? Okay, great. So, I have 16 years of experience, and throughout the 16 years, every year I had a new dream. The dream of doing my MA here in ASC, and I did it. The dream of uh, accomplishing my PhD on corpus linguistics, on syntax, and things I didn't necessarily know much about, but I was able to accomplish them. A dream of working in a specific university, a dream of presenting in conferences. Every year I had a dream. And the most difficult part of any dream is what? Which stage? It's stage one, step one, where you have doubts. You're not sure whether you really can or not. In this stage, you need Nile Tissel. So I believe that Nile Tissel should work every time or any time you need it. 
not necessarily the time of presenting or the time of workshops. So I thought of a plan that can be accomplished with, that have a lot of activities every month. So first of all is to have circles of discussions in academic circles where you send us any problem you want to discuss. You want, you're starting new research and you want ideas. You, need, you have a problem in class and you want to work on it. Send us the problem without a full proposal. And you will have to read just two articles. You don't necessarily have to prepare like a full presentation. We'll have more members reading about it. We'll have more discussions throughout the year. And you will have a certificate of participation instead just a certificate of attendance. So to tell you, you can go further, go ahead, you can add this to your CV. So this is one of the points. Also, I'm thinking you're, of you're one two, day... I'm sorry, the two minutes sorry? are up. The two minutes are Can up. Can I have half seconds? No, for fairness, no. I'm keeping it too. And thank more you. other activities monthly, okay? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the, I believe, yes, final candidate for member at large is Samir Omara. Good afternoon, colleagues. I am Samir Omara. I've been a, a teacher of English in public schools for 20 years. I've been a teacher trainer for 10 years. I would like to nominate myself for this election because I think I could represent the public schools. My concern is to help convey the Nile TESOL values sessions to the, to the remote areas, to the public schools everywhere in Egypt. Uh, I think I have some experience with that and some good networks. Uh, in 2015, I joined Teachers First program. This is a national program for teacher training. Then I, uh, I was nominated to be the, the CBD lead trainer for the project. Then I've been the BD lead. Currently, I am posted at the head of professional development. Uh, before that, I got the Ideal Teacher Award from Ministry of Education and the Excellent Teacher uh, Award from the Ministry of Education. I got a TEFL course at the University of Exeter in UK. I got a professional educator diploma of educational leadership from AUC. I would like to nominate myself just to convey this, this message of uh, Niall Tiesel through online discussion threads, face-to-face -face sessions, through action research rounds. All I would like to do is to help public schools. All I would like to do is to vote for those who are the most eligible ones. Thank you so much. Thank you for, so much, Samir. Okay, so I, I have here uh, for National University's Maisa Hashad. If you could please just stand up and wave. Um, she was the uncontest, uncontested uh, candidate for national universities, and she was appointed by the board to fill in somebody who left that seat. So we thank you for what you've done so far, and thank you for continuing into your own full term. So thank you. Um, and she, she, I would love to give her time to talk, but unfortunately, we, we have to move on. So we have, of course, a very, uh, uh, all offices are important, but the final one is president-elect. And we are going to start with Rada Abu Hassan Al Sayed, please. Good afternoon. I'm Rada Abu Hassan. I'm an English language teacher and teacher trainer with 22 years of experience and a degree in education and leadership and management. It is such a pleasure to be here again in front of this remarkable group of people who share the same passion and the same interest in teaching and learning English. Two years ago, when I stood in this same place, I had very little knowledge, to be honest, about the amount of effort and love that is put into this organization by passionate people who only aspire to provide opportunities for English language teachers to develop professionally, to network together, sharing ideas and experiences, and to stay up to date with the latest developments in the field. The projects I have taken part in on the SIGS committee and the Relo Nile TESOL mentor program during those past two years have provided me with lots of insight on the impact Nile TESOL leaves on all those who participate in its activities. I can tell you this only gave me more enthusiasm to take a bigger role trying to make the importance of this wonderful work we do more visible to a broader audience. I visualize Nile Tiesel as an organization that reaches out to English profession, language professionals everywhere in Egypt and that offers them real opportunities to understand and voice their needs. The English language teaching community in Egypt is a very dynamic one indeed. 
and I believe that Niall Tiesel can do a lot to foster learning and development and to guide all those teachers throughout their challenging quest for knowledge and for a better quality of education for the learners of English. I understand how huge this responsibility is and know it requires lots of hard work. Yet I know there are all those wonderful people here to support me. I look forward to working with all of you to achieve those goals. Thank you very much. Thank you much. Thank you very much, Clara. And finally, uh, Mohammed Khalil Musa for, pres for president-elect. <coughs> Bismillah. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Mohammed Khalil Musa, and uh, I'm a PhD holder. And I've been working in the field of teaching for 19 years, inside and outside Egypt. Uh, I work at two different places. I work at Cairo University as an English instructor, and I work at the American University in Cairo as a teacher trainer. And for the last two years, I've been heading the Professional Development Committee at Nile Diesel. Throughout the last two years, I travel to different places, and the Professional Development Committee managed to organize 18 different events. And we reached out to hundreds of teachers across Egypt. Throughout my trips to different governorates, I met many passionate souls, many instructors who have got passion for this profession. And I believe that time has come for to bring all those passionate souls under one solid name, under one family of Nile Diesel. Finally, I would like to thank you all, especially those who traveled all the way to attend the conference. You are really my source of inspiration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Okay, so again, if you have a paper ballot, please complete it now in order and raise your hand so an usher knows to collect it from you. If you are doing this online, online is open until the end of the General Assembly, but it does collect timestamps, so anything after two, we're not going to count. Okay, so and if, if you didn't get a paper ballot, please do it online from the Nile T. Saul webpage. To the candidates, I thank you all. I wish I could give all of you more time to let us know you, but unfortunately with time constraints, things were what they were. Thank you, and you can be seated. Thank you. Okay, so all year, starting from before the la from after the last conference, there is a group of people who are working uh, to help the professional development of their colleagues. Uh, this is through the RELO Nile T. Saul Mentor Trainer Program. And so we are, the next part of the agenda will be to present them with certificates. So please, Ruth, if you can. 